and gentlemen, welcome to today's webinar on enhancing tablet coating for continuous improvement brought to you by ACJ in association with ET Health World. This comprehensive webinar discusses in detail the key aspects of achieving a perfect finish for the coated tablet. Even though coating is one of the final steps, it plays various functionalities in tablets thereby meeting diverse clinical needs and increasing the value of oral solid dosage forms. I, Rashmi Mahabian Kaur, Principal Correspondent at ethealthworld.com, would now like to welcome the esteemed speakers who have joined us today to dwell into the intricacies of tablet coating process optimization, sharing insights, best practices, and innovative approaches to enhancing efficiency and quality in tablet manufacturing. To take forward this important webinar, please join me in welcoming the eminent panelists today, starting with John Carey, Head of Sales North America at ACG. John is a seasoned executive with over 30 years of invaluable experience in the industry. He holds a chemical engineering degree with a prestigious college of engineering at Rutgers University. Throughout his distinguished career, John has been a driving force in the advancement of pharmaceutical technologies. He has authored and delivered numerous lectures on pivotal topics such as fluidized bed, wet granulation, and tablet coating technologies, showcasing his deep understanding and expertise in these areas. Welcome, John. Next, we have Shantanu Damle, Technical Director, South Asia at Colorcon Asia Private Limited. Mr. Shantanu Damle is an accomplished professional with 15 years of experience in the pharmaceutical industry. He holds a B-Pharm degree from the Institute of Chemical Technology, Mumbai, and an MS in Pharmaceuticals from Bits Pilani. His expertise extends to overseeing the cutting-edge formulation center of excellence in Goa and spearheading the establishment of the new technical service center in Noida. He is a recognized industry expert having presented papers as esteemed conferences such as AAPS and CRS. Very warm welcome, Mr. Damle. Thank you, Rashmi. And we also have Mr. Mayur Patel, Head Formulation Development at Apnar Pharma. Mr. Patel, a seasoned leader with the over 17 years of rich experience in the pharmaceutical sector, Mr. Mayur has earned his master's degree in pharmacy from AR College of Pharmacy, Gujarat, laying the foundation stone for his illustrious career. His expertise lies in driving successful development, facilitating seamless technology transfer and sustaining product life cycles of a myriad of complex generic products. He holds several patents reflecting his pivotal role in driving innovation through his esteemed career. A very warm welcome to all the panelists. And uh, with this, we will thank now... Thank you, Rashmi. Thank you, thank you so much for joining. And we will now be having a presentation by Mr. Shantanu. So over to you, Mr. Shantanu. Thank you, Rashmi. I'm sharing my screen. Uh, please confirm yes. that you see it. Uh, thank you, Rashmi, for the warm welcome and the introduction. It's my absolute privilege to be participating in this uh, uh, Optimize 360 coding series. Uh, thank you again to ET Health as well as ACG for organizing and um, I welcome everybody who has joined uh, uh, on this uh, session. Before I begin, um, uh, Rashmi has already introduced me. A quick word about uh, Colorcon. Uh, many of you may have already uh, worked with Colorcon in various different uh, aspects of product development. So Colorcon is a leading formulation partner and supplier of choice for many solid oral dosage formulation companies. Uh, we, of course, uh, work with a variety of uh, fin coating systems, software solutions for control release formulations, uh, specialty excipients, as well as uh, solutions from functional packaging. So with that said, I will uh, delve into the, the topic of the presentation today, that is film coating process optimization, enhancing the effic efficiency and quality of uh, film coated tablets. So when we talked about uh, uh, this session last time, uh, or whenever we looked at the film coating uh, formulation, uh, uh, it consists of four different aspects. Uh, the tablet pour or the substrate onto which the coating is going to happen, the coating formulation itself, that are the properties of the coating formulation, the equipment with which 
the, uh, the coating would be uh, sprayed or applied, and of course, the process parameters. So what we are going to focus today on the selection and optimization of various film coating process parameters, as well as understand the influence of tablet core, coating formulation, and the equipment. There's a lot of different science uh, involved in designing core tablets for film coating, choosing the right coating formulation, optimize, it, optimize for your uh, expected functional properties, and also working with if, uh, you know the the best process parameters that would give you the desired outcome. So let's let's look at uh, the process parameters in today's session. In the previous session, if for those who have attended, we looked at technology evolution from film coating formulation perspective, and and today we will talk more about the process parameters with the objective that we want to achieve a perfect uh, tablet finish after coating. But when we really look at the coating process, uh, a lot of parameters play a role. You know, this is similar to a pre the previous slide where we, you know, from a core parameter perspective, the size of the tablet, its friability, the design and shape, uh, the logo design, uh, the placement of the logo, uh, of course, the film coating formulation itself. You have heard different types of opa dry families, uh, you know, coming with different solids content uh, uh, based on the composition, different viscosities and productivities. And then when you come to the process parameters, of course, the pan load, bed temperatures, atomizing pressures, uh, CFM, different type of temperatures, all play a role. Uh, and, and basically the tablets have to undergo a lot of uh, processes, uh, uh, you know, we need to withstand these all together in the coating equipment before coming out uh, uh, to become, uh, to, before coming out with the perfect finish. So when we look at defect-free coating, it's, it's about, uh, from a process parameter perspective, it is about balancing the process parameters to control the evaporation of the solvent and achieve the coating uniformity. So we are really simplifying and breaking this down into two processes. One is the thermodynamics of the coating process, that is the amount of air, the temperature at which the air is coming, the application of the spray rate, as well as the drying of that air, uh, you know, the, 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 the drying of the coating process. So the overall thermodynamics which depends upon the airflow, that is the CFM, the spray rate, inlet temperature, and to some extent atomization air because it controls the droplet size and therefore the evaporation rate uh, in the coating process. And then we will quickly look at the overall uniformity of application of the coating. When we say uniformity, how the tablets are getting distributed uh, uh, with respect to the fan speed, the baffles, as well as from, from the distribution inside the pan when there is a multi-gun setup available, when we move to a bigger scale machine, when there are four guns, six guns, and beyond, how is it important to ensure that there is a uniformity of distribution of spray inside the coating process? So coming to the thermodynamics part first, uh, what we look at is uh, majority of the time, the temperature at, of the product which is getting coated. So, that product temperature is something which is uh, a balance of uh, three aspects uh, of the process, the airflow, the spray rate, and the inlet air temperature. So we will look at each one of them uh, one by one. They are pretty simple. Everybody on who has done uh, coating uh, uh, sometime or the other in different equipments would be able to relate to this, but it is important to look at all three together and understand how they impact uh, the product temperature. The reason product temperature becomes important is that the product temperature is something which is independent of the scale as well as it is depend it is specific to the product which is getting coated. Uh, so we'll talk more about it a little later, but let's look at uh, you know the product temperatures that are generally followed for aqueous coatings uh, can range somewhere between 30 to 50 degrees Celsius depending upon which type of coating you are applying and, on, and depending upon which is the substrate on which the coating is getting applied. One of the times it is very important to also be cognizant to the LOD or the moisture content of the uncoated core, uh, either uh, at the time of pre-warming or after pre-warming and then measure it again after the completion of the coating as well as drying. Typically the temperatures at which we operate or standard processes operate uh, somewhere around 40 degrees Celsius. We do not see a difference from the LOD of the tablet significantly, but uh, it is important to be again, uh, you know, aware of this fact uh, to make sure that the process efficiency and the overall weight gains is something which is, uh, is which is in line with our expectations. So that is something which is a good practice to kind of do when we are designing or optimizing process. 
but at the temperatures we do not we should not see a lot more difference uh, more than a half percent or maximum one percent from the from the tablet which was starting before of course airflow which is uh, often a type often a, a factor which gets a little bit less attention compared to the temperature and spray rate so the airflow is the, the overall volume of air that it is coming to dry. So imagine uh, imagine the blower or you know the air drying principle where some of the times in 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 a, in a humid environment, it's just the quantity of air that is coming can help dry the can help, can help dry the substrate. So uh, how does it impact? Basically, uh, uh, one thing it is important to be measuring this airflow. Uh, of course, it is very important to make sure that we are operating the equipment that is uh, used for coating at uh, at its maximum efficiency, at its highest possible airflow, and yet still achieve a good negative pressure. So, uh, you know, it is it is sometimes uh, feasible to get a negative pressure at a lower airflow, uh, but we must be mindful of this fact while designing the coating process to really set it up to have the highest airflow. As you can see here. Uh, the, the, the from a thermodynamic perspective, it is a combination of the temperature as well as the airflow that are affecting drying. So uh, we have to make sure that the airflow is uh, what the machine is designed to give or highest possible airflow that we can give from the machine. And then obviously have temperature as a second component coming in to track the tablets. It is important to also take into consideration the fan load if we are really looking at the process from an exhaust temperature perspective. Because again, uh, in case where uh, the pan load is relatively on the lower side, you can see the example on the right, uh, there is a possibility of uh, the exhaust uh, temperature coming up on the higher side because the, the incoming air would you know, pass through the path of least resistance and not through the tablet bag getting to the exhaust uh, and giving a pseudo higher temperature with heat. So uh, for such cases, it will be advisable to monitor the bed temperature uh, or, or have a different type of uh, uh, design for, for, for ability to control the process uh, effectively. Inlet temperature is relatively easy. As we increase the inlet air temperature, the product temperature increases. But uh, as I said, we need to be mindful that the inlet temperature and air flow together need to be used to influence the product temperature. And, and on the other side, what uh, what is going to impact the product temperature to go down is the spray rate that we use. Uh, spray rate is uh, often used from grams per minute uh, perspective. Uh, so uh, probably you are seeing a poll come up right now, but that's uh, probably for later. You can answer this question since you are seeing it on the screen, but we'll come to that question a little bit later. It's about maximizing gloss of coated tablets. Uh, and I'll, I'll wait for, for the audience to answer this. How does gloss be, can be enhanced? Can be enhanced by increasing CFM or post coating doubling or use of a good gloss coating formulation or maintaining a good bed temperature. So we'll come to this answer, but I'm curious to know what the audience thinks about it. Uh, uh, and then we'll, we'll start. So uh, hopefully everybody has answered this question. Uh, and then we are talking about spray rate, and uh, a lot of you have answered that uh, you know all of the above, which is uh, which is the right answer, of course. Uh, and we'll come to that slide where I will explain. Some of you have uh, selected uh, one or two of it. Yes, they are important, but all four are are going to play a role to maximize the gloss, and we will see how in in a few minutes from now. So uh, spray rate measurement is an important factor here. Uh, so spray rate measurement depends on a lot of uh, how do we set a spray rate depends on the substrate and of course the drying condition. So what is the shape of the tablet? How is the fine load? What is the distance of the gun? Uh, size of the tablet based on you know uh, number of guns overall air flow. So the so the spray rate is something which is dependent a lot on uh, on the product which is getting coated and the properties of that product. Okay, so we'll come. Uh, uh, when we when we decide the thermodynamics of the coating process, we set the required inlet temperature, maximize the airflow, and then we adjust the spray rate to get the desired product back temperature. Uh, that is how we should follow to you know kind of have a robust and a reproducible consistent process from one part to the other. So if you if you now you, you could see that they are like a seesaw. When when you increase the suspension flow rate, it is going to 
go to a little cooler side of coating and how do you improve, you know, improvise that is by increasing the drying air quantity or the drying air temperature. Uh, and possibly you should see another poll coming up now, which is talking about the bed temperature, how, how, how impactful is the bed temperature from a perspective of, uh, uh, you know, from the product perspective. So uh, if, if you can see the poll right now, and then we can move to the next set of slides. All right, I, I, I'll continue. I think the poll would come in a minute, but let's continue our discussion uh, around the bed temperature and scale exhaust temperature, because I'm aware many of the times we tend to have a deliberation whether to consider exhaust temperature or the product temperature uh, during our process of optimization. And what we have believed uh, at Telecom is since product temperature is uh, relatively constant from one scale to the other, from lab scale to the commercial scale, Right up to the development scale of core technology transfer, it is it is advisable to consider product temperature and of course monitor the bed temp exhaust temperature because the exhaust temperature, as you could see, can depend on the fan load, uh, different type of machine designs, but product temperature ultimately is the output that we want to achieve uh, to control the coating process. But of course, on a routine manufacturing, when the batch sizes and the equipments are fixed. We could either do a product temperature or exhaust temperature depending upon the uh, equipment. So uh, this particular poll is about uh, that you see is about maximizing gloss. Again, something which we will uh, I think if uh, uh, we will get to it uh, in a minute. I'll I'll wait again and continue to continue to discuss on the slides that I have. So. Hopefully you have answered, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a similar poll that was passed put in earlier. So if you've already answered, please ignore it. Uh, and then, and, and we'll quickly look at the results for those who have not answered and, and continue our presentation. So you can see from a perspective of a coating uniformity, how the tab, well the tablets mix inside the coating pan is important. You could see a 48 inch perforated coating pan running at a 5 RPM. And when the load is insufficient, uh, you know, you would see the tablet bed stopping inside the spray zone. So there is intermittent cascade, there, is, there could be overwetting or poor uniformity. Whereas if the pan load is correct, at the same RPM, you could see a much more uniform uh, cascading movement of the tablets, uh, uh, which would definitely improve the overall tablet coating performance. Of course, there is there could be a possibility of increasing the pan speed in cases where they are needed, and I'm and I'm sure in my next speakers who would talk on this topic would also cover. There are other possibilities from an equipment perspective in how to handle a lower pan load uh, type of a process. But of course, for 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 tablets which are Robust have do not have much viability issues. Uh, this is something to uh, take into consideration. However, it's always advisable to use the right pan load. We'll take a quick uh, video in, in to look at how uniformity is impactful. We all do gun validation. We all do uh, uh, tablet atomization pressure adjustments and pattern pressure adjustment. So let's quickly look at how they are impactful. I'm not showing uh, what is the best uh, uh, possible way of doing it, but I'm, I'm just trying to show how they impact. So when we do a spray test for a multi-gun setup, uh, and when we do an atomization, you would see that there, are, there could be possibilities of lower droplet size within the inner side of the spray and a higher droplet size around the periphery. So that is not a good sign because we don't want droplet size variations. So we kind of adjust the atomization pressure to get this kind of a fine mist of a spray. Similarly, when it comes to a pattern pressure, uh, the pattern is covering the uniformity of distribution within the bed. So like what you see on, you know, here, uh, where um, uh, uh, there is a gap between the two guns, this is something which we have to avoid. So setting the atomization pressure to get the fine mist, and then also setting the pattern pressure to ensure that, that there is adequate coverage and no open areas uh, the color damage to the hole becomes an important aspect uh, during coating uniformity. 
So moving on from uh, what we have discussed so far, the thermodynamics of the coating process, uh, combining airflow, third by temperature, spray rate, how they impact, and of course the uniformity of distribution from the rolling and the this uh, put the the cascading of the tablet based on fan speed and 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 the, the spray distribution through atomization and pattern pressure adjustment. Now a quick uh, walkthrough in terms of how do they actually impact the quality attributes of the coating process on the actual tablets. Um, most of the times, if we were to really list down what are the quality attributes for the final tablet to have, we would we would talk about the appearance. But uh, beyond that, uh, for immediate leaf coating system, it needs to have a good disintegration time, surface roughness, gloss, moisture change. That is the LOD we were talking about in the CFM example. Uniformity of weight gain in terms of an RSD, especially important when we are doing active coating type of application or as also important from perspective of color uniformity. Process efficiency in terms of uh, what is the percentage weight gain versus uh, percentage weight gain versus uh, the actual applied spray, color uniformity and clear logo definition. These become an important quality attributes because we are talking about achieving perfect finish. So perfect finish tablets has good gloss, a smooth surface, very good color uniformity, clear logo definition, good weight uniformity. So these are qualitative terms, but in some cases you could actually quantify some of these aspects to make sure that there is indeed uh, uh, an assessment of uh, uh, the film coating quality. An example of that is a profilometer, which kind of measures the surface roughness. So you could actually quantify and get to an SA value or an RA value. And of course, the, the lower value indicates a smoother surface. Uh, in certain cases, just by visual observation, you may be able to differentiate like you see in the left co examples here, but there could be certain cases where uh, just the visual observation may appear it to be smoother, but in reality, it is not. So there could, in, in cases where we are really looking at achieving smoother tablets, there could be this type of quantitative measurements. And of course, how does our parameters that we discussed impact it? Of course, the temperature and airflow are uh, you know, uh, impactful factors here. So they are reverse impactors. So where that uh, from the graph, you can see increase in temperature and increase in airflow would decrease the surface roughness. That is, you see both the bars coming on the reverse side. So uh, from if you are looking at increasing roughness, then you would have to decrease temperature and decrease airflow. So our objective is to increase smoothness. And that is why you need to have a higher temperature and higher airflow. And you could see that uh, solids content and spray rate are on the reverse side. So many of the times increasing or going to a higher spray rate can lead to a rougher surface, as well as higher solids in coatings which are not designed to be higher productive coatings. So there are certain coatings, uh, we talked about it during last webinar, like Opa dry TVX, Opa dry 85 series, which are designed to be at 20%, 30% solids coatings, which are uh, going to get a smoother finish even at that solid level. Now, there was a question on the gloss, and uh, maybe most of you have answered that correctly as well. Uh, how, what are the parameters that impact gloss? Again, looking at the thermodynamics and distribution, the, the smoothness and gloss are related in, in terms of uh, a better smoothness also has a tendency to have a good gloss. Uh, of course, there are specially designed gloss coatings. Examples like upper gloss 2, again, 85 series PVA based coatings have that give higher gloss than the, the standard coatings that sometimes we use. But beyond that, I think, again, maintaining a good temperature airflow, ensuring that the temp uh, spray rates are, uh, 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 are controlled gives a higher gloss. So if you can see the surface response curve on the right, you see at the higher airflow conditions. Uh, uh, you, as well as a good temperature is where you get the maximum gloss, which is the orange and the red side of the surface response. The tablet uniformity, I talked about to product UX, which can be a higher solid coating, but it is important to have color uniformity at our standard weight gains of 2.5 to 3%. And of course, putting weight uniformity in uh, our color uniformity is going to depend on the pan speed uh, as well as the spray rate. Uh, than we are trying to achieve. So, of course, higher fan speeds, um, uh, optimized spray rates, and uh, a good opacity in the coating uh, would ensure that even at higher solids, you would be able to get a good tablet uniformity. 
the last slide uh, ultimately if the tablet has no hope to identify the strengths uh, or the manufacturing uh, uh, manufacturer's name i think uh, it is important to ultimately get this right as well uh, there are cases like uh, cases where the api is too hydrophobic or the system is not coating system is not having sufficient plasticization or in few cases where we use higher than required levels of lubricants creates hydrophobicity in the surface and then that's where uh, there, there could be a possibility of getting the logos like we see on top uh, examples are the traditional coatings which are based on HPMC based uh, compositions. Of course, it doesn't happen on all products, but those sensitive uh, core tablets or substrate is where you could see it. Working with again uh, more optimally plasticized systems, good addition systems would have helped achieve a very, very good clear definition of the logo as you can see in the example. So to summarize, basically, uh, we talked about balancing the thermodynamics of the coating process as well as the uniformity of distribution of the coating process. And basically then understanding these parameters uh, to study how they impact uh, on achieving the tablet finish in terms of smoothness, in terms of gloss, uniformity, clear logo definition, and the overall tablet appearance. So with that, I think uh, I will end my presentation and um, I will be back again to answer if there are any few questions towards the end. Thank you, everybody, for patient listening, and I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you for the insightful presentation. I would now like to invite Mr. John to share his presentation, please. Well, thank you, Rashmi, and, and thank you, Shantanu, for uh, your, your presentation. Mm -hmm. And thank you for everybody that's joining us today. So to introduce myself, my name is John Carey. Um, I am based in the U.S. and working with ACG, uh, our equipment division. And uh, as a brief introduction to ACG, ACG is a worldwide based company with divisions um, most well known for our supply of consumables in capsules as well as films. And finally, our machinery divisions that provide both various types of process and packaging machinery, as well as uh, instrumentation for inspection and track and trace type technology. Now, to briefly um, give you some uh, a few slides uh, from session one, in case you're you're new to joining us, and then going through some of the criteria for modern tablet coding, and looking at the the, the process and the machine design um, that accompanies it, and uh, and then we'll get into uh, questions. I think a little bit later on. So just as a reminder on why we're actually coding tablets, um, the many reasons, uh, in some cases, simply for elegance, product identification through, through color or, or logos, uh, looking to mask the taste um, for, especially for bitter APIs, uh, make them easier to swallow, um, more palatable uh, for the patient, as well as to provide uh, physical and chemical protection for your product, uh, protecting it from humidity, oxidation, light, uh, making the surface of the tablet stronger to avoid any erosion or, or uh, damage during packaging, transportation, uh, and ultimate delivery to the patient, as well as the fact that there are applications in which you may be looking to do functional um, purposes of your coding. Uh, delayed release, enteric release, as well as other applications such as modified release or Oros type technology. Um, and there is also applications in which you might be actually applying active to the surface of your tablet. And that might be for multiple APIs within a single unit dosage, or simply to be controlling various types of delivery technology. Now, ultimately, the, the coding process from a, uh, a, a micro perspective is simply uh, producing a coding droplet, um, applying that to the particle itself, allowing the particle to become wet, allowing the, uh, the solution or the coding formulation to spread, form a film, and then ultimately surround your particle itself and applying that process 
over and over again until you've achieved the weight gain and the film thickness that you're looking to achieve. Now, the very basic principle of the coder is to have a, a rotating perforated drum uh, with your tablet bed uh, positioned uh, within that drum, airflow and spray concurrently uh, being applied to the tablet bed. And this core process has been the, the, the basic uh, from the advent of this type technology in the 1960s. Now, what has changed quite substantially is the level of precision control and design um, over the years. Now, in comparison to equipment delivered many, many years ago, uh, modern tablet coders, our customers are looking for a tremendous amount of flexibility in terms of the, the product shapes and sizes that they deal with, looking at uh, different batch sizes or different batch loads within a single unit. Um, also looking for a single unit to handle not only simple film coding, but modified release or active coding, uh, all within a single system and being able to deliver the level of precision needed for each of those processes. Um, there are also applications that may require um, not just water-based or aqueous-based formulations, but organic solvent-based formulations which also is a requirement uh, that some customers may look for. Um, moving on to the machine itself, looking to ensure that the machine is efficient, operator ergonomics, making it easy to charge, discharge, um, easy to clean, especially in multi-product applications, uh, ensuring that the machine is reliable, uh, looking for minimizing the cost of operation and finally, from a performance aspect, looking for a system that is ultimately scalable from your lab or pilot systems, reproducible batch to batch, and also producing a highly uniform coding tablet to tablet. Now, um, similar to I think what Shantanu showed, looking at the coding quality um, is, is ultimately the goal here. Um, and the, the, the quality limits and guidelines uh, for your product may be involving film thickness, looking at the weight gain um, that you apply to your coating, as well as looking at physical aspects of appearance, uh, weight variation, disintegration, LOD, dissolution, um, and also looking at the assay for your product itself, especially in applications where you've added actives in the coding process. Now, one of the, one of the key aspects that um, we are always looking for customers to think about is not just the, the pure aspect of the, the uniformity of the tablet as it comes out, but also looking at the productivity and the ability to save coding material. And no disrespect to my friends at ColorCon, but certainly if a customer can produce a batch faster, uh, achieve their results with less coding material, ultimately that, that is a great advantage in today's competitive environment. Now, I'd like to break the process down into three major areas, okay? your product being the tablet core itself and the coding formulation. Secondly, the machine design. And thirdly, the process itself, which joins the two of them. Now, uh, looking at your tablet and the coding formulation, these are the factors that we see that we have to deal with in the machine, looking at different tablet shapes and sizes looking at also the surface area of the tablet itself and whether or not you, you have logos, uh, looking at the friability of the tablet. And that's a very critical aspect. Um, and I'll get into some of the issues regarding mixing as well, but looking at ensuring that your tablet is robust enough to, to not only uh, handle your R&D scale, but when you get up to production scale and dealing with 
three, 400 kilos in a drum, can the tablet itself withstand the mechanical stress of the coating process? And then looking at your coating formulation, and I know this is much more in, in Chantanou's area, but looking at the viscosity of your solution, ensuring that we can effectively spray that uh, and atomize it effectively. And then looking at the coating formulation from a tensile strength, flexibility, adhesion characteristic onto your tablet. And finally, also looking at the solids content. Now, the, the range of solids content, um, the less evaporation that we need, and I think Chantanu talked a little bit about this in his uh, thermodynamics, but the, the more we can increase the solids content effectively and still provide a good quality will enable us to reduce the process time um, and ultimately, again, be, be a more effective process. And finally, looking at the solvent itself that's utilized in the process, whether it's water-based or solvent, organic solvent-based, uh, there can be some tremendous differences in the design requirements, not only of the equipment itself, but of your facility. Now, the process parameters, which were the, the unit itself that, that kind of links the your tablet and core to our machine, looking at your air volume, air temperature, air humidity, which are also your, your drying uh, capacity that you're delivering into your system, and then looking at your spray rate, atomization air, and pattern air. And finally, not directly linked to this, is also the product movement within the pan itself. Now, when we look at product movement, there's many factors that do affect the product movement. First, the drum speed of the coder itself, the baffle design. Again, both of these factors linked to the machine. And then looking at your tablet weight, tablet size, tablet shape and as well as your batch load in the coder. And then finally, the tackiness of your solution. And all of these will affect the product movement. So it's imperative that as you look to scale up, and, and again, as Shantanu showed some videos showing the movement of tablets uh, within a coder, it's important that not only do you have good flow of your tablets, but ensuring that you're not um, over uh, moving these tablets where tablets would become airborne or tablets are moving too slow through the coding zone itself. Now to move on to the machine design, um, modern equipment has uh, many more features, both in terms of the design of the machine uh, mechanically, control-wise, uh, air handling-wise than many of the, the, the older generations. So my goal here is to take you through some of the points that are critical to the process and not every aspect of the machine. The first is ensuring an optimal flow pattern, both in the spray and in the airflow or the drying capacity that's brought into the, the system. Now, one of the unique aspects of the ACG design is actually a, a separation of the spray zone from the drying zone. Now, the tablet bed itself, which is positioned in the, 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 the lower uh, left quadrant of the drum as the drum is rotated in a clockwise direction, uh, we utilize the upper portion of the bed for your spray zone and then we use the lower portion of the bed for our drying air. Now, one of the aspects of modern coders that most customers are looking for is a wide range of operation. And although we'll get into that aspect a little bit later, one of the other key aspects is this the exhaust air shoe. And it's critical that the exhaust air shoe be sized such that the cross-sectional area and the air that's being drawn through the tablet bed itself does not provide any ability for the air to bypass the tablet bed. So 
if the tablet bed would be small enough that the exhaust air shoe would have a uh, area of the drum that is not covered by tablets, you would see air bypassing the bed as shown in the graphs that Chantanou showed earlier. The current designs of units are designed so that this exhaust air shoe is sized so that at the minimum tablet load in a drum, there's no ability for the air to bypass the tablet bed. One other aspect of the drum is providing a very large open surface area, yet still ensuring that you have mechanical um, integrity of the drum. Uh, our systems utilize uh, nearly 40% open area. And you can see in this photo to the right-hand side uh, that you can actually see through the drum itself. Uh, you can see the baffles and the nozzles in this due to this large open area. This also helps ensure that we have a lot of control and flexibility over balancing our drying air in comparison to the amount of spray that we're adding and balancing the thermodynamics of the process. Now, one of the most critical aspects of uniformity encoding is the ability to effectively mix your tablets and effectively mix your tablets regardless of shape, size, um, as well as considering the range of friability of tablets that you may have uh, within your various uh, products that you need to be coded. So most, uh, sorry, one other aspect of it is ensuring that within this various product load, whether you go down to a 10% load or a 100% load, that your baffles don't actually stick through the bed itself. So our, our current baffle design, which you see here, is a very, very low profile three-dimensional baffle. And secondly, we provide a number of baffles in the drum to ensure that not only are we getting good mixing um, in the radial direction, but we get mixing in the axial direction. Now, the drum geometry provides very steep sidewalls, both in the front and the back, uh, what typically we call the cones. And the, be the benefit of having a very steep cone is that allows us to extend the cylindrical section with any given volume. So maximizing the cylindrical section is also maximizing the amount of perforation and an and area that we have to draw air through your tablet bed. And finally, ensuring that the, these baffles also are going to facilitate a relatively gentle handling of your tablets um, is also critical. Now, as we scale from lab to pilot to production, one of the most critical aspects is to ensure that we're still maintaining a relatively efficient process. So as we scale, one of the, the factors that we're looking at is as we scale in diameter, we're also looking to scale the depth of the drum. Now, we do scale the diameter of the drum up to a certain maximum of approximately 70 inches. Beyond 70 inches, we would no longer look to scale the diameter of the drum because if you continue to scale the drum in diameter, you start to create a very deep tablet, tablet bed. And that would create challenges with more friable products. And it also starts to reduce the amount of surface area that you have in relation to the size of your tablet bed. So once we start to exceed 70 inches or approximately a 700 liter drum, we only look to extend the drum in the axial direction. So we no longer increase the diameter, but as we would go from a 700 liter to a thousand liter to a 1400 liter to even even larger, we will only continue to extend the drum in this axial direction. The benefit of this is we are substantially increasing the surface area that we have for spraying 
and increasing the number of nozzles. And therefore, what we're able to do is significantly increase the productivity for these large batch coders. Now, not only is the ability to mix your tablets effectively, ensure that tablets continually present themselves to the surface of the tablet bed for the spray, but also ensure that the velocity of the tablets as they pass through the spray zone is uniform are all critical factors to ensuring a uniform coating. Now, uh, one of the uh, examples that I have here is of a, in our picture, a 700 liter drum. But what we've done is shown as you increase the number of baffles, um, you substantially change the velocity of the tablets in the drum itself. Now, a drum that had, would have only four baffles, as you look at this graph, you can see that in the very front of the drum and in the rear of the drum, we have some tablets that are moving relatively slow. And then in the, the more medial area of the drum, tablets that are moving very fast. Now, although this may not seem to be a real critical factor, the actuality is, is that you're spraying uniformly across this entire surface area. So tablets that are moving through the bed at a much slower speed in the front and in the back are going to pick up more coating, maybe potentially be over wet. Tablets that are moving in the higher speed region may be picking up the right amount of coating, or they may be not getting enough coating itself to make this an efficient process. So subsequently, as we go from four to six to eight baffles, you can see how that we get a much more linear profile of the velocity. So whether your, your tablets are presenting themselves in the front, in the medial area, or in the back, we have a much more uniform velocity of the tablets passing through the spray zone. And this is a, one of the most critical factors to ensuring uniform coating. It's also a critical factor in helping us optimize the spray rate and maintain the most optimal spray rate through the process. Secondarily, um, the spray nozzle itself. Um, to me, the spray nozzle is um, equally critical to the, the mixing and the fact that the spray nozzle has to deliver your solution effectively across the entire spray zone and uniformly with droplet size. So our X1 spray nozzle that I show you here first is manufactured by Schlick of Germany and in integrates their ABC or anti-bearding technology. Now, what's unique about this is if you would look at older type nozzles with horn type pattern air configurations, this type configuration creates a backflow of air. And you can see in this illustration or this photo itself that the spray formed with this type nozzle and with a smoke generator, the smoke is being actually drawn into the nozzle because of air eddies that are created. Now, what this does to your spray is this creates a lot of bearding or back spray onto the nozzle, thereby reducing the effectiveness of the nozzle. And if you build up enough of this, you're also going to start to affect the spray pattern itself. The ABC cap, which I show you in, in, in this photo, um, in this photo in here, has a very different profile. And the pattern air, which is flattening out your spray pattern, does not form those same eddies. So that you can see that here, our spray pattern here, with a subsequent smoke generator, it's not being drawn, but it's being carried forward with the spray. And this leads to a much cleaner process and helping apply more of your coating to your product bed itself and less to the nozzle, spray arm, and, and other mechanical parts of the coater. 
Now, the unique aspect of our X1 nozzle is the fact that we've built the nozzle in a uh, split configuration with a docking mechanism and a separate nozzle itself. So the nozzle itself can be easily removed with a simple um, single mounting screw that doesn't require any tools. And this also enables the nozzle to be positioned on to the spray arm uniformly each time it's taken on and off of the, of the spray arm. Now, in short, and we'll, we'll get into position of spray nozzles a little bit in, in a few photos, but ensuring that your operators can reproducibly position the nozzles on the spray arm batch to batch between each cleaning cycle is also a critical aspect to ensuring a uniform process. Now we've also produced the nozzle in a configuration that it can be completely taken apart without any tools and looking to ensure that the components themselves are as robust as possible. And here you can see a breakdown of, of the spray nozzle. Now, there have been a lot of studies um, and Chantanu showed um, a little bit of insight into the spray pattern of the nozzle itself and looking to ensure that you have uniform droplet size throughout the pattern. One of the more critical factors in ensuring that you have a more uniform droplet size throughout your entire pattern is the balancing of pattern air. There are two basic mechanisms out there in the market to deliver pattern air um, to the spray nozzle. One is by having a valve integrated into the nozzle itself, that as you rotate that valve, atomization air is bled into the pattern air channel. Now, the advantage of that is simplicity and cost. The disadvantage is repeatability. And for that, um, our approach is the second approach where we have an independent connection from our control system to deliver pattern air. So that provides our controls the ability to more precisely balance the atomization air to the pattern air so that we can control the process uniformly without any concerns of an operator not setting that valve mechanism precisely or repeatably. So studies done by Schlick at their test center, looking at the droplet size distribution um, of the nozzle. And I'll show you some, some graphs here. But the most important thing is to have a uniform droplet size. Now the graphs at the top here, what's referred to as round jet is showing a case where we're not using any pattern air itself. And in the center of the spray pattern, you have a larger droplet size and greater density of droplets. And in the outer periphery, you have smaller droplets with less density. Now, as that would pass through your tablet bed, you would receive this kind of pattern where again, in the center, you're delivering more moisture, a greater degree of solution onto your tablet bed with the periphery so sides of your spray pattern having a lesser delivery of coating solution. Now, adding pattern air, if the pattern air itself is too high, um, you get the exact opposite you actually compress your spray pattern to the point that you are creating a very fi finer droplets um, in the center and you're pushing the density of droplets and the larger droplets to the periphery. And in this pattern, you get the exact reverse. You're gonna have your, your finer 
area in the center and your heavier or greater solution applied to the outer sides. Neither of these um, is what you're going to be looking to achieve to get good uniformity of coating. Your ideal spray pattern is to balance the atomization air and pattern air, to get a more oval pattern, a more uniform droplet size throughout the entire spray pattern, so that as your tablets are passing through the spray zone of each nozzle, every tablet, regardless of axial position, is receiving the same amount of coating. So combining the velocity of your tablets in the mixing with having a uniform spray pattern is how we look to ensure the most uniform application of the coating tablet to tablet. Now, on small lab units where you have a single nozzle, things are quite straightforward. But as you move to pilot and production machines where uniformity, or excuse me, where efficiency is achieved through multiple nozzles, multiple spray zones, it becomes critical to ensure that you properly space your nozzles so that you minimize any gap between your spray pattern, as well as ensuring that you don't have any overlap. So having nozzles too close together would result in overlap of your spray pattern. And with overlap, you're going to get an area of overwetting. And if you have your nozzles too far apart, you're leaving areas of your tablet bed or your spray zone that aren't receiving any coating, hence reducing the efficiency of the overall process. Now, as you look to position the nozzles, and, and if you remember one of the earlier photos where I showed you that in the tablet bed itself, we're looking to have a spray zone that is in the upper part of the tablet bed and a drying zone in the lower part of the tablet bed. Um, the critical aspect is to position your nozzles in the upper part. Now you don't wanna position your nozzles at the very top of the bed. At the very top of the bed, as the tablets are coming up and as they reverse direction to create the waterfall effect, um, you basically have a point of almost zero velocity. So you're positioning your nozzles closer to 20 to 30% low, a low position or anywhere between one fourth to one third um, down on the tablet bed itself and positioning them in a very vertical direction. Now, spacing of the nozzles from the, the gun to bed, roughly 200 millimeters is a very uh, typical uh, distance, although depending upon the friability of your tablets, how they might be affected by the atomization, air, pattern air, also looking at your type of tablets if they're um, very hydroscopic or hydrophilic, you may also look to adjust the position of the nozzle. But before optimizing, 20 millimeters is a very, very typical uh, starting point. Again, uh, a down, approximately one third down and using the lower two thirds of your bed for your drying air. Now, as you would look to, to go down to a much lower loading in your coder, uh, and our coders are designed to go down to 10% of the brim volume. So a 700 liter production coder can go down to 70 liters of tablets itself um, and still ensure that our exhaust air shoe is fully covered. But we also ensure that the nozzle arm itself can extend itself to still provide the same gun to bed distance and the same general configuration of one third down the tablet bed for the positioning of your nozzle and two thirds of your tablet bed for your, your drying zone. Now, 
controls, uh, I'm not going to delve into all of the, the detailed aspects of the controls, but ensuring that your control system is going to precisely control air volume, temperature, dew point of your process air, um, these parameters are forming the drying capacity delivering into your coder. So knowing that you're also going to be spraying at a consistent rate, having a consistent drying capacity as your spraying is extremely important. So the other aspect that I mentioned earlier is looking to ensure as much of your equipment is instrumented as possible, looking to control your DP across your tablet bed, looking to ensure that you don't just use simple needle valves for your pattern air, but control your pattern air directly to more precisely control your atomization air spray. These are all critical aspects in, in the automation system. Now to get into a short case study, um, this is a case study of a customer that had an existing 950 liter coder supplied by a competitive supplier, European-based manufacturer. They had pain points in the efficiency, productivity, the cost of manufacture of their particular product. Uh, their product was a 1000 milligram tablet being coated with OpaDry and their production requirements uh, required them to install an additional coder to meet product demand. And ultimately they did select an ACG SC1000 for their increased capacity. Now, upon delivery and upon looking to optimize this process, um, the 1000 liter ACG coder was picked because it was nearly identical in capacity to their existing 950 liter coder. But effectively, when we looked to optimize this process, we were able to load 450 kilos into the coder um, as opposed to the only 337 kilos that they had in their existing process. Now, both systems incorporated nozzles manufactured by Schlick. So their existing coder, although it wasn't ACG's X1 nozzle, it was a Schlick manufactured nozzle with the ABC technology. So that did make it slightly easy to convert the process up to our platform. Um, both nozzles using 1.2 millimeter liquid ports. It was an aqueous based process. And in our loading of 450 kilos, we did have to adjust the total amount of solution to apply the same amount of solids. And the solution concentration was still 15% solids. Now, although our thousand liter coder was only a 5% increase in the actual coder size, in terms of the theoretical amount of tablets that you could put in, we were able to put a 33% increase in the actual batch size that we ran. Now, one note, each of these batches is a sublot for this customer's match, master batch. So in the competitive unit for their master batch, they had to run four sublots in their 950 liter coder. In the ACG 1000 liter unit, by, eight, by being able to load 450 kilos of tablets into this coder, we were able to produce their master batch in three sublots. Now, from a process perspective, in the 950 liter unit, their range of inlet temperature was 60 to 70. Um, we did... Sorry to interrupt, Mr. John. Uh, due to time constraints, I would request you to please wind up the presentation. Sure, I only have a, another slide or two. Great. So uh, in the 1000 liter coder, we reduced, we did the similar air, uh, similar temperature, uh, also achieved similar exhaust temperature, similar bed temperature. But what we did do with increasing the spray was increase the airflow to balance the thermodynamics. We also looked to increase the atomization air and also increase the pattern air to deal with the higher spray rate. Now we also were able to use um, uh, a much larger spray rate, one, by increasing the number of the spray rate per nozzle, but our unit also incorporated more nozzles than the, the 950 liter coder. 
And ultimately, we were able to reduce the process time from 212 minutes down to 145 minutes. Now, although that might look minor, the fact that we were able to complete the batch in three sublots meant that our total production time for three sublots was 435 minutes as opposed to 845 minutes. So the overall production time was basically cut in half, significantly reducing the amount of time, labor, and utilities. So I'll finish up by, by, by simply saying that um, ACG, um, uh, we have a tremendous amount of experience combined with ColorCon with their materials, combined with our equipment designs, and we have an entire team based in our India uh, ACG laboratories that can assist you in optimizing, troubleshooting, or in expanding your, your production. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, speakers, for the focused presentation that has perfectly set the tone for our panel discussion. Uh, we would like to apologize for the technical glitch resulting in the poll flashing multiple times on the screen. Uh, so, as we have little time in hand, let's quickly begin with the panel discussion on enhancing tablet coating for continuous improvement. My first question is for Mr. Mayur. How critical is the technology transfer of film coating process? Okay. So, basically, among all the manufacturing operations uh, which is carried out for the tablet production, I guess coating is the most critical uh, manufacturing process and uh, even though uh, in the coating the technology transfer or the scale up is even more challenging i can say that coating is not just a science it is a combination of art and science so because uh, the reason being the technology transfer or the scale up of the coating is very critical why because there are lot many variables lot many process parameters uh, are affecting the coating process and ultimately the quality of the coated tablet. All the parameters which we have just discussed in the two presentations from the color con and ACG. So uh, I was just discussing the all the process parameters, all the variables are dependent on the mainly three pillars. The variables related to the substrate cores, variables re related to the formulation of the coating and variables related to the equipment, process equipment. And out of these variables, many of the variables are scale dependent variables. So once we transfer uh, a product from lab scale to the commercial scale, so we can say that at lab scale, we manufacture a batch size of around 5 kg. And at the commercial scale, we may increase batch size up to 200 kg, 300, even 500 kg and even beyond. So the scale dependent parameters uh, are going to change drastically between the two scales. Uh, which are the parameters we can say that scale event are like pen design is going to change pen rotation speed we need to change then design of the baffles then volume of the airflow is going to change spray rate gun to bed distance even droplet size the ratio which we have to keep between atomization air pressure and the pattern air pressure all these parameters are going to change so once we uh, plan for the technology transfer this we have to consider that this process is going to be very critical and we need to take uh, very good care how we can transfer, uh, uh, transfer this process. Has frozen. So we move on to the next question. Okay, so going on to Mr. John, how do advancements in nozzle design and automation improve the tablet coating process efficiency and precision? I think one of the key aspects in, in the nozzle design is the uh, amount of focus that's been on the spray pattern itself and ensuring that you can deliver a nozzle that's going to very uniformly deliver droplet size uh, mm -hmm. across the tablet bed. Um, and that's been one of the, I'd say, the most critical aspects um, to looking at uniformity and um, ensuring that uh, you minimize overspray, minimize bearding, uniformly deliver the droplets, I'd say those are all critical factors and all things that have been achieved compared to nozzles that were delivered by manufacturers 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. So uh, the next question is for Mr. Shantanu. What are the requirements of negative pressure during coating operation? 
thank you, Rashmi. I think um, uh, I did that based upon it, but it's good that this question has come. Um, we must uh, uh, look back at why negative pressure is really needed actually in the coating process. And I think John explained that. Uh, uh, as well, you know, uh, typically when we have the airflow coming in, we need the air to entire air to go out uh, in a unidirectional manner so that the drying happens more uniformly. So to have that uh, negative pressure, it is uh, uh, very important to first maximize the CFM or the incoming air pressure, uh, incoming air CFM, and then adjust the negative pressure. Uh, it is it is important to keep in mind that. We need a very slight negative pressure. It, of course, changes depending upon the scale, but we do not need, need very extreme levels of negative pressure. Uh, otherwise, it would disturb the tablet movement and cascade and cause the tablets to pick up along the wall of the pan and fall back in the spring zone. So uh, within uh, the uh, limited amount of negative pressure that is needed, I think just to maintain a unidirectional airflow inside the coating pan, but the most important fact to remember is to have that negative pressure at the highest possible airflow and the CFM that the machine can deliver. Okay. Uh, the second part is, can you also provide us an input on the scaling up of spray rate or pan speed? Spray rate and pan speed. Okay. So I think uh, Mayur mentioned on various factors that get uh, changed based on scale and both spray rate and pan speed are are those factors you know dependent on scale and he really touched upon you know transfer of uh, coating process is not just uh, transfer of process but it also you know we, we can say it is also transfer of knowledge from uh, current process uh, at one scale to another process so that knowledge transfer is what we need to apply while scaling up um, pan speed and pan uh, spray rate so when we look at uh, uh, Spray rate. I will. I will talk about the factors that we mentioned, and even John covered that. It depends really on the substrate uh, as well as the coating formulation. Uh, it is important uh, to make sure that those considerations are taken into account uh, while designing pan uh, spray rate at a from one scale to the other. Of course, the the drying efficiency from one scale uh, and the other. It needs to be taken into consideration too. So if we were to really look at a simple correlation, then assuming that occupancy level uh, is similar and there is uh, from uh, from scale one to scale two, then you can you can simply correlate it to the airflow uh, at normal scale. So uh, a simple equation of S1, V1, which is the spray rate and volume of air at scale one is equal to S2, V2, which is the volume of air at scale was at a higher scale and calculate the S2. So be mindful that it is just a starting spray rate and be prepared to re-optimize based on how it goes. But that could be a good starting point, I would say. From a pan speed perspective, again, I think Mayu touched upon that. Assuming the equipments have similar geometric design, uh, if we have to scale up a pan speed, uh, again, it could, it could be a little difficult if uh, on a smaller scale we are at 40 or 60 percent occupancy and at a bigger scale we are at 80 to 90 percent occupancy but again assuming that they are relatively similar then we kind of use a linear velocity of the tablet movement uh, and and i think john touched upon that how how the tablets are moving based on the pathway design um, so uh, you know the, the, if the linear velocity is compared at both the scales and that is given again by a very simple very simple formulation of 2 pi into uh, the diameter of the pan which is 2 pi r, the radius of the pan and the number of rotations. So that, that linear velocity matching of the tablets at different scale can help us get to a starting point of, uh, of pan speed. Having said and given these two equations, it is really important to make sure that we are watching the process. We are looking at the considerations of the tablet, the substrate, coating formulation, and, and then and then take that as a starting point when we are moving from one scale to the other. Hopefully that answers the question and I, and I, and I invite any more comments from John or the one. Yeah. So uh, coming back to you, Mr. Mayur, how well does advancement in coating technology help reduce the risk associated with scale up of uh, film coating processes? So as we discussed, there is a lot of risk associated with this uh, scale, scale up or technology transfer of the process. 
but ultimately what is the key for the successful of technology transfer is i believe that identifying the critical process parameter is the key so what are the critical uh, i mean lot of parameters are going to affect the coating process but uh, among them what are the critical most critical process parameters we need to identify that and uh, one of the uh, very good technique to identify these uh, cpps is the doe study uh, we can perform the design of experiment studies where some of the parameters we can kept as the constant and other parameters we can kept as the variable so again this choosing the variables and choosing the constant is again uh, somewhat complex we can that, say that because all these parameters are interdependent and uh, we can say that many of the parameters are scale dependent also so uh, well process understanding and prior knowledge is required to design this doe study and by designing this doe study we can minimize the efforts minimize the time and even ultimately we can reduce the cost required uh, so by this technology we can reduce the risks associated with the uh, technology transfer of the coating process uh, mr john uh, what is your advice for scaling uh, a coating process from lab scale to production? So I, I think I just might have two comments on that. The, the, the first is taking a look at uh, the parameters when you're developing a process on your lab bench to ensure that ultimately you're not designing a process that's going to be outside the range of the pilot or production equipment that you ultimately look to deliver it to. I think if you start to take a look at the uh, parameters uh, of air volume to batch size, spray rate, et cetera, that exist on lab equipment, it also has a very, very large range. And, and when you look at the, the high ends of those range, um, it may exceed what you're able to do on a production scale. So there's no sense in developing a process that ultimately can't be delivered to a production application. OK, um, the second thing is um, I like Mayor's comment that, that ultimately this is this is science and art. OK, but but I like to associate the art side with experience. And and although you can always look at aspects of the thermodynamics, as talked about, as Shantanu mentioned, as you you scale up, you can look at um, calculating the radial velocity of of the drum as you look to larger diameters of drums, you still have a certain amount of, I'll call it experience or art, okay? When you look at what's a good mixing pattern, what's a good flow of these tablets? Is, 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 the, is the tablet bed moving too fast? Or, are some tablets becoming a little airborne? Some of, this, some of this is a little subjective. And again, I'd say that's the art or experience side. Fortunately, I would say this process is probably at least 80% science, but the 20% art or experience is also going to be where you can look to optimize and improve and look to uh, make your process more efficient and maybe even more cost effective. Okay, so this question is open to all. Are there any special parameters to be followed for aqueous coating of moisture sensitive actives? Uh, starting with you, Mr. Shantanu. Uh, yes, I think uh, uh, it, it becomes a very interesting scenario when we are trying to coat the moisture sensitive actives with an aqueous uh, coating because that's where our entire drying efficiency in the process comes uh, in, 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 uh, in the mind. And I think, uh, uh, I believe John talked about the importance of higher solids in the coating. So we have to look at uh, the, this question in, a, in two aspects. One is the how the moisture sensitive drug gets exposed to moisture during the coating process, that during the four hours, five hours that the coating is happening. And once the film is formed, is the film able to prevent the moisture induced degradation of the tablet? So for the latter part, we, you know, there are products like aqueous moisture barrier, over dry AMB2, those types which kind of uh, you know help uh, have a barrier property to the film. When it comes to controlling uh, that in the process, uh, in terms of how do we manage the process parameters for coating moisture sensitive drugs, I believe using higher solids coating, like like again the MB220% solids, 
ensuring good drying efficiency, balancing airflow and spray rate are, are going to be critical uh, to men ensure that we are not overwetting the tablet pores uh, and, and not leaving any residual moisture. So that percent LOD measurement, which I talked about, could also be a useful parameter to kind of do while initially uh, setting up the process uh, for coating moisture sensitive activity. Okay. If I can, if I can add, I think the, the comments yes. that Shantanu made, I, I, I completely agree with. But one of the things that I think we would look to um, in terms of trying to create the most efficient processes possible is often with moisture sensitive tablets or tablets that have a high amount of disintegrant, we would look to create um, a, a slow spray rate in the beginning of the process and almost form a seal coat onto the tablet itself. And once we can get a base seal coat uniformly on the tablet bed itself, then we can start to increase the spray rate knowing that we'll be able to apply the coating more efficiently, okay, without having any core penetration of the tablet itself. So uh, again, the, the increased solids content and, and the things that Shantanu mentioned, but again, looking to keep a production of process efficient, looking to ramp your spray rate once you've produced a base coat on your tablet can help ultimately create a more efficient process, more productive process. Well, Mr. Mayur, would you like to add anything? Just I wanted want to add one thing is uh, by uh, increasing the product temperature within the uh, prescribed range, if we can increase the product temperature, and uh, uh, hopefully if the API is not that much heat sensitive, then uh, the moisture sensitive uh, active coating, aqueous coating can be uh, done efficiently by increasing the product temperature. So uh, we can uh, ensure the evaporation of the simultaneously evaporation of the moisture from the tablet core. Thank you. Thank you so much, experts. But, uh, uh, again, but uh, yes, just, just a minute. But again, it should not uh, lead to the spray drying as we are increasing the temperature there is a chance that it should it will lead to the spray drying but uh, we, we need to ensure that it should not lead to the spray drying of the uh, solution thank you thank you so much mr mayur well that brings us to the end of this panel discussion thank you so much experts for such an interesting panel discussion where we elaborated on so many aspects covering the coating I would like to take a moment to express my heartfelt gratitude to each and every one of you for taking the time to attend today's webinar on enhancing tablet coating for continuous improvement. Your presence and attention engagement means a lot. We kindly ask you to take a moment to complete a brief survey about today's webinar as your feedback is incredibly important to us. Your insights will help us ensure the future sessions are even more valuable and engaging for you. Thank you all for joining us today and wish you all a wonderful day ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.